Good evening and a very warm welcome to today's special interview. I'm your host, Anisha Nayar Thavan, and we have with us today Mr. Gaurav Arora, spokesperson Coin DCX, who will offer insight into the latest buzzwords in the world of finance and investing, DeFi or decentralized finance, cryptocurrency, and the all new Octo app launched by Coin DCX. Now, let me try and decode some of the buzzwords for our viewers. Cryptocurrency is nothing but money in a digital form, which is built on a strong foundation of blockchain technologies. To make such an investment, you can invest into one or multiple crypto coins from a crypto exchange such as CoinDCX. Cryptocurrency has witnessed an exponential growth across the world as in India, and the decentralized blockchain economy for mass market is expected to cross over a billion customers by 2030. Now, this kind of investment is a quantum shift from traditional investments like deposits, stocks, gold, or real estate, as the assets that you are purchasing are non-tangible. The advent of Web 3.0 will enable anyone with a smartphone to take part in this economy and reap the gains from it. Towards this end, CoinDCX has announced its waitlist campaign for the first of its kind easy access mobile app called Octo. Today, let's take a look at what's DeFi, how is it different from traditional finance, and how will CoinDCX democratize the crypto universe to a much larger part of our population using the Octo app. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Aurora. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to a great conversation with you. So let's get started. Now, decentralized finance or DeFi sits at the epicenter of the crypto universe and has the potential to disrupt traditional finance. Now, what is it and how does it work? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a hot question these days. Everybody asks that question. So, you know, before I jump into even DeFi, let me just take a minute to uh, talk about another uh, popular acronym, Web3. Uh, we've all heard about that a lot, right? You know, so what is Web3? So Web3 is what uh, the uh, call is the latest version of the internet. You know, if you go back a few years, Web1 was just what people call the read the internet, where uh, uh, there were a few people who contributed and you just read the information. Web2 is the internet, which we are part of, where we uh, are read and write. We all contribute to the internet as content providers. You know, we post our videos, our images and everything. Web3 is a, a fundamental shift from that. And uh, so what people, uh, you know, uh, call it, it's called the read, write and own internet. So that the third part is a very important one where you not only contribute to the internet, but you actually own the value, the content, the information that you uh, contribute. So that digital ownership actually unlocks a lot of use cases or features. So that's what Web3 is. So DeFi and you know, this, this, uh, this Web3 is evolving across what I call a, a lot of different spheres. So you've got entertainment and NFTs and games, you've got finance, you've got identity. So DeFi is broadly uh, the finance part of, of Web3, where we call it decentralized uh, finance. Uh, and uh, what, what DeFi, the theory is that the earlier people were just buying and selling some of the crypto assets that you talked about, but now people will be able to undertake more financial activities uh, in a decentralized manner in Web3. So that's kind of a, a summary of what DeFi is. Okay. So DeFi by its very nature is uh, doubted to be decentralized and non-custodial. What does this mean? And what are the benefits that it brings on the table for investors? And you said that in Web3, because of DeFi, you'll be able to do a lot more uh, when it comes to different financial products. What do you mean by that? Yeah, no, I think those two points, those two terms, let me try and explain those. So there's decentralized and self-custody and they, they go hand in hand, right? So decentralized uh, really means uh, uh, that there is no central, um, you know, uh, entity or a company uh, controlling the value or information. So if you think of, uh, just to understand it better, if you think of the current, uh, say, you know, Facebook, if you write a post on Facebook, that post is actually controlled. It's sitting in a, a Facebook database. Mm -hmm. It's controlled by Facebook. Facebook figures out how to, whether to show it or not, or to render it. So they're centrally controlling it. 
any value generated by any of these, uh, whether it's your post, your video, is also controlled centrally. So with decentralization, because you own your own data, your own post, the control goes back to you. And the other part, self-custody, is really what unlocks the decentralization. So self-custody simply means uh, you're, you having the ownership. Uh, if you want, you take that ownership back or the access back from uh, somebody. So you just disconnect your, your uh, custodian wallet and nobody else can uh, kind of access that, uh, that data that you've created. So, uh, so self-custody actually enables decentralization in a way. Uh, now let's let's uh, one of the things I actually want to talk about that you know this whole decentralization and democratization is not something new. Uh, mm -hmm. It's honestly if you go back a thousand years to our financial evolution, it's been going on forever. So if you uh, you know look a thousand years back in the feudal ages, um, assets and capital was centralized. It was controlled with, by kings and you mm -hmm. know lords. And, and then what happened was we got these things called corporations where uh, some of the asset control, so a few bunch of people could come in together, they could pool in money, they could form a corporation, and they could uh, take on risky endeavors, they could, you know, travel the world, they could uh, dig for gold, they could do multiple things. So that was one of the corporations. So that, in a way, decentralized capital ownership. Then you go a little bit further, you say, okay, you know what, we can trade these stocks also. So these shares that people own, now people can trade it across. And that also made it in a way decentralized, it made it inclusive. So more participants, people like you and me could buy a small share of Apple stock. We could participate in how Apple is growing up. So it, it's been honestly, uh, you know, it's been a thousand year journey of just a decentralizing control, decentralizing access. And this next step, Web3, DeFi, is this continuing that journey. We're saying, hey, not only you can decentralize ownership of a company, you right. can decentralize ownership of your tweets, of your videos, of, of any assets, anything that you create. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's really how, uh, the, what decentralization means. And in terms of your question of, hey, how does it add value, right? If you, if you uh, just first principles, whenever you bring in, efficiency into a system, you bring in speed into a system, value is created, new use cases are unlocked, right? Uh, another simple example is if you look at digital payments, right? Earlier it was payments were done in a slow manner. You could only do cash payments. Uh, di digital payments becoming fast has unlocked so many more use cases. You can now just at the click of a button buy a Netflix subscription. Right? You could never do that earlier. You'd have to go to some place, you know, uh, pay money and enable that use case. So, so it has, un it's unlocking more and more use cases. It's creating value. So DeFi will do something very similar. Just the fact that you can now, uh, you know, uh, decentralize its value. You can control your value. You can sell it to somebody. You can transact with somebody. It will create value for all the stakeholders in the system. Okay. So it, it sounds like a win-win. Could you give me more examples of, the kind of transactions you can do. You, you've spoken about payments, but uh, what more can you do with DeFi, uh, which can be used in the real world or people are used to doing in the real world? Yeah, yeah. so I think the, the first transaction has been what we're all used to, right? Which is just buying and selling of, of currency or Bitcoin. Uh, but what you could also do in a decentralized manner is you could lend money to somebody saying, uh, you know, I have some assets and somebody needs it for a certain value, you can lend the money it, it, without having to go through a bank. Uh, you could uh, buy fractional parts of, of an asset where you could say, hey, this is a painting and I could buy a fractional ownership of it. Uh, uh, you could participate in markets which you could earlier never have access to. So it could be a you know Russian real estate, it could be a, a stock market somewhere in the world. So it just enables uh, a lot of different types of transactions which either was slow, inaccessible to you, or restricted to you just because of the sheer size. Wow, you're talking, the way you're talking, it sounds like there are endless possibilities in what people can do sitting where they are and, uh, you know, with the means that they have. It's amazing. Now, uh, DeFi is considered to be an experimental niche within the wider crypto space. And yet the total value unlocked, DVL, in DeFi has increased by over 30 times since July 2020. So what are the main pillars that are powering the shift towards DeFi? So honestly, I think that 30 number is too small yet, right? The 30x number really is small. And if you look at it, even now, most of the growth 
that has come in DeFi has come from, I would say, two uh, features. There's a lot of speculative activity that's happening because people, you know, early adopters, people are seeing the potential of the system and they're thinking that uh, things will get better. And uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, what is called liquidity uh, providing. So that's really the first use case where people are saying, hey, we want people to trade. Uh, for people to trade, we need liquidity in the system. So we are incentivizing people who give liquidity. So that has, uh, you know, people have come in, they've deposited their money into a certain token uh, to provide liquidity in the system. They're making some returns out of it. So honestly, those have been the two early use cases. Um, I think there is still no real use cases. A lot of real use cases have been developed, but they've not been adopted. So the potential of this, this whatever number people throw out, 50 billion or 100 billion of DeFi, it is nothing compared to the potential because um, like I said, you know, DeFi is nothing but a better way of doing existing financial transactions. If so, hence the market is existing financial market, which is in hundreds of trillions. Uh, and that's the potential that DeFi could access if these technology, uh, these uh, protocols are adopted uh, to do even one small uh, real financial use case, it could suddenly shoot into trillions. So, uh, like I said, it's really, really early stages. These $50 billion are just uh, people who are seeing the potential, but the potential hasn't been realized uh, yet. So it's like a ticking time bomb then to explode. But I'm wondering, though, sort of where does that leave me? Just how do I get onto this bandwagon? Because I'm in Web 2.0, right? I don't know how to get into this. Uh, with Web 3.0, any investor with a smartphone can invest in uh, cryptocurrency. So how is CoinBCS acting as an enabler in this space? Uh, can you tell us about the Octo app? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think that's a question everybody's asking right now, not just you as a retail investor. Institutions are asking the same question. Hey, how do I come onto this uh, platform? How do I access it? Uh, and institutions can still hire smart people to, you know, work their find their way around it. For retail investors, it's incredibly complex right now because there's just uh, so many steps you have to do to even make a simple transaction. And I think that's really the biggest problem this uh, particular, uh, you know, ecosystem has. It's just very difficult. And just if you go back a few years, right, uh, something, the first use case, like I mentioned, was buying and selling a crypto that used to also be very difficult. Uh, you know, only people who, who really understand how to create a wallet, how to uh, create a key, could actually go and buy Bitcoin and kind of the, so those people who made money in the early days. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, companies like Coin D6 came in and made it easy and accessible for everybody to come and take part in that buying and selling e ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to do this, uh, similar things now in our, uh, in the DeFi world. We want to extend that that uh, that learnings that we have and that ease of use that we brought for people to other use cases. Uh, and, and But before we kind of tell you how we're doing it, let me just uh, give you a flavor of some of the problems, right? Uh, okay. So in DeFi, what are the problems? Most people don't know, don't understand things like chains, protocols, all of that stuff, right? And, but why should they? They shouldn't need to know all of that stuff to take to do something simple. Most people don't understand what is a private key, how do you create it, they don't understand if I lose my private key, I lose all my assets. So we have to kind of make that simpler for, for our users. Um, users don't know where to even start. Hey, what are these dApps? How do I access a dApp? If I, what they understand is I want to earn some interest. Mm -hmm. Why do they need to know which dApp to go to? Is this dApp reliable? Is this a Ponzi scheme? Is this a rug bull scheme? So, you know, they don't know how to start, what is trustworthy and all. So these problems of discovery, trust, ease of use mm -hmm. are some of the problems plaguing and which is what we need to kind of really solve with Octo. Mm -hmm. How? Uh, can you tell us how does Octo work? And for the layman, lay person like me who is even technologically uh, challenged, can I make it work? How, do, how does Octo work? So, so we are launching a, a completely, like I said, a new a new wallet called Octo. Uh, so for it will be available globally for uh, everybody, and for Indian users, it will be available within the Coin D6 uh, Pro app. So as a user, you will just start seeing an Octo wallet in your tab, and you uh, you know very simply, you can just you don't have to like I said worry about the DApps. You just have to worry about what you want to do. So a simple use case could be earn, saying hey, I want to earn money. It gives you a list of earning opportunities with a percentage interest. You tap it and you just 
deposit uh, money and if you have some tokens in your a coin DCX pro wallet you can move that with a one click uh, into the octo wallet and deposit and start earning interest so like we said we are abstracting out all of these complexities of uh you know to protocol and chains and all of that stuff uh we we will be launching very soon uh, within a month for public use but right now we are testing the app uh, ourselves uh, just making sure like i said it's easy to use um, and once we do that, we will add more and more use cases. So we almost want to make it like a, a super app of, of uh, use cases that are powered by crypto. Uh, we're hoping to get around what we call 100 protocols enabled for you. Uh, so whatever you need to do, and we'll keep on improving because the world of DeFi is uh, changing so fast. So we'll keep on adding more and more use cases. Uh, and you know the goal is it should be as simple as my grandmother should be able to do it. So that's that's what we want to achieve. Right. On Octo, is there any mock mock payments or mock transactions that people can do? Any videos or information so that we understand what's better? See, as a lay person, I, I may be only scratching the surface of the little that I know. Uh, will you keep telling us about new things we can do on the app and how? No, good point. Uh, so I have two points to that. First of all, you're right. Education is most important, right? I think we need to tell our users what they're getting into. Uh, if there are any any risks, so we'll continue focusing on education, creating a set of learning series which our users can you know follow and learn. Uh, but the other thing, you know, as a product person, I also fundamentally believe that if your product requires a manual, then you probably haven't built a good product. So we we want to make it so simple that, uh, like I said, you don't need to uh, learn. We want to work hard so that you don't have to work hard in understanding and following the things. Uh, but where needed, we will definitely follow it up with education and, and learning. All right. Sounds so exciting. I'm sure the whole population is waiting for something uh, uh, for, for Octo to come through because this will be uh, a way for them to be part of uh, DeFi and not just hearing about it, but actually contribute and uh, you know earn some value out of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anisha. Nice talking to you. Now, this brings us to the end of today's discussion. Thank you so much, Aurora, for joining us uh, with your insights. It is indeed very informative. Uh, this is your host, Anisha, signing off. Stay well and take care. Bye-bye.